Gratitude is not just a holiday spirit. Gratitude is a profoundly impactful state of mind and heart that can radically change your life. It is directly tied to your spiritual maturity. I don't, I don't like that part, um, but, but it's true. As we grow spiritually, we become more grateful. Or maybe as we become more grateful, we grow spiritually. You see, when gratitude pushes into the deep places of your heart, it can change your life. I'm going to give you five declarations, five things that you, can, that you can say, you can put on your mirror, you can put on the dash of your car, and if you can get your mind around these five statements, this will push gratitude into the deep places of your heart. These five sentences are going to sound really simple to you, but if we take them seriously, if we really wrap our heads around them, they will change the way we think and they will change the way we feel. And when you change the way you think and feel, you change the way you live. Think about these five declarations that can put gratitude into the deep places of your life. Are you ready for that? All right. Here's the first one. Declaration number one. I want you to say this with me. What I have is enough. For this, I am grateful. Declaration number one. Now, Thanksgiving started as a harvest festival. You all know that because of the pumpkins and the cornucopia and all that stuff. Pretty much every uh, post, you know, agrarian culture has a harvest festival across all of humanity. Here's the scene. Keep this in mind. Winter is coming. The harvest is at an end. There's no grocery stores. There's no deep freezer in the garage. There's no Costco. And so what that means is what you have gathered now as a result of the harvest is all you have to keep your family alive until the next growing season. The harvest literally is your survival. And so when the barns were full and the root cellars were cram-packed and there were barrels full of fresh salted meat and pickled vegetables and cider corked in jugs, when all that happened, it was time for a party. Why? Because the hard work of the harvest was over and because the harvest meant your family, your community was going to survive until next year. That means that Thanksgiving was a celebration that we have enough to live. Maybe even we have enough to share. But somehow, at least in the America I live in today, it feels like uh, Thanksgiving's become an opportunity to be told by advertisers and everyone around us that what we have isn't enough. You know, that our turkey isn't big enough and our family isn't Norman Rockwell enough and the 40-inch TV we got two years ago on Black Friday isn't quite enough, uh, big enough or thin enough and the Xbox we already have isn't good enough because there's a new one that came out this week. And I'm not saying... That I'm not saying that getting a great once-a-year deal on a, two, on a TV is a bad thing. I'm not going to look down on you if you had the courage to go out into that blessings upon you. But I am suggesting that we each need to evaluate our own hearts with this question. We need to look and see, do we have a centered place within us where we believe that what we have is enough? Or in that centered place, are we driven to get more, to get one more thing, to find something else. Luke 12, 15, Jesus gave us this warning. He told them, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of one's possessions. Grab that last phrase, keep it locked in your head. One's life is not in the abundance of one's possessions. The possessions aren't bad, getting a great deal is not bad, no guilt or shame. But when we live from a place where we are driven to find our security or our happiness or our sense of safety or value in the stuff that we have, here's what happens. We are restricted from having freedom. We're restricted from having free and open relationships with others. We're restricted from experiencing the moment that we have as abundant. See, when we can look at what we have, whatever we have, I know some of you are saying, come on, seriously, Mark, I don't have enough. Okay, I get it. I've been in that place. But if we can look at what we have, whatever it is, however much or little, and say, for this moment, it is enough. The possibility of generosity, the possibility of freedom opens up. What I have is enough. For this, I am grateful. Okay, that's a start. But gratitude isn't all about our stuff. It goes, it goes deeper and further than that. This is the second declaration. Say this with me. 
The time I have is enough. For this moment, I am grateful. Okay, this is painful for me. One of the aspects of my life that I've struggled with the most is a feeling, a haunting feeling that I have had as long as I can remember that I just don't have enough time. Here's the funny thing. That feeling hasn't changed in my life. When I was working, when I was working 80 hours a week and not ever taking time off, I still felt like I didn't have enough time. And when I was working 40 hours a week and guarding the boundaries of my life very carefully, I felt like I didn't have enough time. And when I was on sabbatical with absolutely no official responsibilities, I felt like I didn't have enough time. And that taught me something really important. That feeling had nothing to do with my to-do lists or my efforts. That feeling was something about me, something about my heart, a feeling that I just hadn't done enough. Maybe, maybe you can relate to that. Here's a painful secret. It's so obvious, but the best ones are. We all have exactly the same amount of time. Think of any class of people that you want, presidents, CEOs, professional athletes, stay-at-home parents, fit people, unhealthy people, high school students, kids, adults, everybody, 24 hours every day, 24 hours every day. The difference between those people is not how much time they have. The difference between those people is how they value their time and what they choose to spend their time on. One of the prayers in the book of Psalms tells us that the way we value our time matters more than we can possibly understand. This is Psalm 90, 12. Teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. The days you have, they, they have a value. Do you see them that way? Because wisdom is tied to how well you value your time. And then in the book of James, we have this other warning that's, uh, that's a little bit dire. We hear James say, come, come now you who say, today or tomorrow we'll travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. You don't even know what tomorrow will bring or what your life may be. All right, someday you and I are going to die. Sorry to be a downer. And when that day happens, whether it happens when we're old and we've lived a full life, God, God willing, or whether it happens tomorrow, when that day happens, your to-do list will not be done. So if our sense of well-being and satisfaction in this life is based on whether or not we finally ever gotten anything done, what does that mean? It means that we can't be happy. It means that we can't be satisfied. It means that we can't be in the moment that we're in because we're always running against the clock. You see, the moment that you're in right now, this one right now, is the only one you're guaranteed. And so when Psalms tells us to teach us to number our days carefully, I think it's asking us to pay attention to the one that we're in because the one that we're in is the only one that we're promised to get. In this moment, do the thing that matters. The time I have is enough. For this moment, I am grateful. A real gratitude extends out, out into the, the world around us. Say this with me. The people around me are enough. For them, I am grateful. Now, I don't mean to say that you have enough friends, however many that number is for you, 25, 500, 2, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying that the people themselves, who they are right now, it is enough right now. You see, one of the places where you are likely wasting enormous emotional energy, one of the places where you are probably causing yourself stress and frustration, one of the places that you may be creating broken relationships is in your need to manage the people around you, in your need to change the people around you so that you can feel better about where you're at. Your spouse, your kids, your coworker, your roommate, your neighbors, other folks at church, whatever relationship that you have, you feel in your heart that your life would be better if they would just be fill in the blank, if they would just be something. 
quiet, loud, listen better, talk better, communicate more clearly, communicate like this, whatever it is, the thing that you put in that blank, whatever the thing is, you want them to be different so you can feel okay. And the energy that you're investing in that space is causing you stress and friction and resistance and broken relationships. You see, when we start accepting the people around us for who they are, guess what happens? They start to feel safe with us. The door of relationship opens up. That creates the possibility of understanding. And understanding leads to intimacy. And it's in that place, a place of safe relationship, where real life change can happen. Not the life change you wished for them, or the life change you designed for them if you were the boss, but the life change they need, the life change God has for them that He wants to bring about in their lives. That happens in the place of safe, intimate community. Not because we caused it, But because you know this, you know this from your own life, we grow when we know we're loved. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to accept bad behavior in other people. It doesn't mean that we're required to stay in toxic or destructive relationships. It doesn't mean that we don't care. It means this, that we change our essential stance towards others from I love you if to I love you, period. The very way that God in Jesus Christ, loves you. In the beginning of the book of Ephesians, uh, Paul starts out uh, with a, a little prayer. He says, This is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. The Ephesians were not perfect. Paul had some things to say to them about how they were living their lives, right? He did. But the starting place, the starting place was thankfulness for who they were. Thankfulness for their heart, for their faith, for being a part of his family. Gratitude. The people around me are enough. For them, I'm grateful. Now, these declarations that we've, that we've just had, they are all really rooted in one other need that I think is universal. Maybe I'm projecting myself onto you, but I think I've heard enough stories to know that this is something that we all, we all deal with. This is at the core. And I believe that if you can get your head around this one, it really will change things for you. Now, this is going to feel awkward, but I want you to say it with me. Who I am is enough. For me, I am grateful. This is one more time. Just let the awkwardness sink in. Who I am is enough. For me, I am grateful. All the other declarations, they end up here. Here's why. When we're hanging our sense of value or security on our possessions, the reason we do that is because we're afraid that we're not enough. When we are anxious that we just aren't performing well enough, that we're not going to get things done in time, that we're not going to get enough done, when we're doing that, we're afraid that we are not really enough. And when we try to change other people so that we can feel better, it's really because we, in our heart, fear ourselves that we are not enough. You see, deep down inside, we all carry the question of our essential value. This is why. Uh, This is why some of us are so desperate to be heard. And we will do crazy, hurtful things to other people to force them to hear us. This is what drives perfectionists. This is the bug, the seed in the core of legalism. This is what gives us that painful sense of urgency that makes us feel like we have to do a thing, we have to say a thing, we have to act in a certain way to prove that we're enough. And the tools that we use to get this value built, they're broad and diverse, as diverse as all of us. For me, the tools have primarily been my performance and my intelligence. If I could do well in those areas, I could feel like I was enough. For you, the tools might be different. They might be your appearance or your business accomplishments or your spirituality or your religious activities or your good kids. Heck, even being a victim can become a special kind of trophy. The deepest place that gratitude can take hold of your life is here. Being able to say who I am, who God made me to be, is enough. It's not pride. It's not ego. 
It is not a claim to be perfect or self-sufficient or fully resolved or mentally perfect or anything like that. It's not a claim to be done in your journey of growth. It is simply acknowledging the value that the one who made you gave you from the beginning. Listen to Psalms 139. For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know this very well. See, God made you. God knows every part of you, and that's not a bad thing. It's a good one. Genesis 1.27, the beginning of the story. God created humanity in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. You, right now, how you are. You are created in the image of God. You, you're not a mistake to be thrown away. You were handmade by God with a good and beautiful purpose. Anybody remember Uh, Ephesians 2.10? For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand for us to do. Who I am is enough. For me, I am grateful. These four declarations that we've made so far, they're about you, they're about your life, but I believe that these four declarations are only true inside the last one. This is the one that binds them together. This is the one that validates them. This is the one that gives us power to live into these things when we feel like maybe they aren't true. Hebrews 13, 15 makes this connection. Listen to the sequence in this verse. Your life should be free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. Now, that's the first declaration, but why should we be that way? Why? For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. The first declarations are true because God is enough. God's promise is that you will never be left alone. God's promise is that you will not be forsaken, that God will not turn God's back on you. I mean, there are days, come on, it's the truth. There are days when you don't have enough to make ends meet. There are days when you're racing against the clock and the clock is going to beat you. There are days when the people in your life are doing more harm than good. There are days when you don't feel worthy. But on those days, and on every day, you are not alone. All of those concerns lie beneath the one who made you, the one who promises to provide for you, the one who promises to give you your days and your provision, the one who's declared you adopted into the family, the one who's given you a good and beautiful purpose in the world. This is declaration number five. Above everything, God is enough. For this I am grateful. One more time. Above everything, God is enough. For this I am grateful. Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast all your cares on him and he will sustain you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says something similar. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Isaiah 41, 10 says this. This is God's voice speaking. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. Toward the end of the fifth chapter of Ephesians, Paul's wrapping up his instructions on how to walk this new walk. And he, he makes this one statement. Give thanks always for everything. To God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks always for everything. That's a big order, especially when everything includes stuff that's painful and hard and not what we want. But this is the reason why. Gratitude changes the way that we see ourselves and the way that we see the world. When I'm grateful, when I'm grateful, I'm acknowledging. Just think about a, a, a transaction where someone gives you a gift. They give you something, you say thank you. In that moment, you're acknowledging a reality. You're acknowledging that you're not the source. You're acknowledging that you're not the end of things. You're not self-sufficient. When I live with gratitude, I'm acknowledging that I need others, that I need God. When I'm grateful, I can step away from some of the most destructive emotional spaces that happen in my life. When I live with gratefulness, I can step away from entitlement. I can step away from a demanding or harsh spirit. I can step away from unforgiveness. I can step away from bitterness. I can step away from fear of not having enough. Gratitude opens all those doors for me. When I'm grateful, I can shed cynicism and my suspicion of other people. Gratitude opens up the doors for friendship, relationship, intimacy. When I'm grateful, I stop grasping and clutching and trying to make for myself, and I can actually begin to be generous. I can let go of some of the things I'm holding on so tightly to. And when I'm grateful, when I'm grateful, I can start to see God all around me. 
Here's the truth. Gratitude is the foundational perspective behind all spiritual growth. If you're not sure about that, just switch it and think about the opposite of gratitude. What kind of growth happens with the opposite of gratitude? Right? What experience do you have in relationship when someone is the opposite of grateful with you when they should be? Right? It corrodes. It undermines. It takes us deep into the dark places of our hearts where gratitude automatically pushes us outward, automatically lifts our eyes. 